Well, uh, like I said, we're kicking off this brand new series. And, you know, the summer is a time where, um, I mean, we have sun, fun, celebration. It's also a time for music, right? Uh, I, I love, uh, you know, we used to have a convertible, and one of my favorite things was to roll down the windows of the convertible in the summertime, especially, actually, we had a convertible in Colorado and a convertible in, uh, in Florida, and I used it more in Colorado than I did in Florida. Go figure. But it was too hot in Florida to ride in the convertible unless you were right on the beach. And then, so when you roll the windows down, blast out the music, it was so it's so fun to to just go riding along, you know, whether you're going to, uh, you know, the beach or a barbecue or, or just to, on a family trip. You know, music communicates so much. It communicates our heart and it moves us into action in, in a way that written word doesn't even do it. I mean, you can remember, there, there's probably things that you tried to remember uh, from your past that you, you have a tough time remembering, but if there's a song tied to it, it's like it seems like it comes back so much easier, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, uh, today, as we look at this music, um, it really expresses the human, human pain and, and joy. It, it, it expresses the desires and feelings that a person has. It really communicates the condition of man. And, and whenever we see a song like this, and, and today what we're going to be talking about is Carry On My Wayward Son by Kansas, um, you know, it, it, it's captured a generation. In fact, this was, this was the, you know, the, the chorus, Carry On My Wayward Son, There'll Be Peace When You Are Done, Lay Your Weary Head to Rest, Don't You Cry No More. This came out in 1976, and a lot of people in that generation, I, I remember I was only in sixth grade, but I remember this. This was like the hot song of the summer. And, uh, but, but for that generation, it, it said something. It said, hey, it's going to get better. And uh, actually, Kerry Livgren, the guy who wrote this song for Kansas, he said it's an autobiographical song. It's a parallel, he said, to his music career. Uh, he said, I've always been on a spiritual journey looking for truth and meaning. It was a, a song of self-encouragement. I was telling myself to keep on looking and, and would uh, find what I saw. The tough thing is that Kerry didn't get, get, uh, find Jesus right away. In fact, he, he looked into Eastern mysticism. He looked into a, a lot of different things, even though he was raised in church. He was raised in a Lutheran church. And uh, he was, he was, he said uh, there was a certain devoutness about it, but I don't think I really understood, uh, understood it or came to a true knowledge of Jesus when he was a child. Now let me just say something here for for you parents. Th this is why it's so important to get the Word of God in your kids because when you plant the Word of God in your kids. Even though he had some kind of spiritual background, it spoke to him. He said he was always looking for something. Why? Because that question had been raised even as he was a kid. It's so important that we get our kids and, and get them plugged in to, to uh, uh, the Word of God and get them to know that. And so he goes on to say he was looking through all kinds of different religious teachings trying to find something. And you even see it in the words of the song. Take a look at this. He goes, Once I rose above the noise and confusion just to get a glimpse beyond the illusion. You know, this really speaks to where man's at, of what man's looking for. Man's looking for something that is real. Amen? Amen. I mean, listen, everybody's looking to get to really see what's going on in life. I was soaring ever higher, higher, but I flew too high. He goes on in the second part of the verse. Though my eyes could see, I still was a blind man. Though my mind could think, I still was a madman. I hear the voices when I'm dreaming. I can hear them say, and he goes into the chorus. I want to break this down because, you know, this really gives us a snapshot. Whenever you see a hit song, it's something that has resonated with a generation, resonated with a society that says, something about this song speaks to me. That or it's got a really good uh, you know, hook to it, right? And, and you go, okay, uh, you know, some of them ain't got any words to them hardly at all, but she's like, I like the beat, you know. 
going back to, I was going to uh, age myself real quick and go, Dick Clark gives it a, a 64 because it doesn't have that great of a beat to dance to, you know. Uh, but listen, you know, people, people are looking for something. We're looking to get past the noise and the confusion that our world sends at us. We're looking for that. And, the, and you know, he said, even though he had been religious, uh, he didn't know what to believe, so he dabbled in Eastern mysticism. This is Kerry Livgren again. He said, I sort of moved from one thing to another, from Hinduism to Baba Ram Das to Zen to uh, or." A Ritania book. Right? That's where he finally found, he thought he found some answers. You see, we can go on our own and we can look for things. But the scripture says real clear, and we, we just finished a, 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 a teaching on the way of God, but it says, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. You see, Many times in our own looking, in our own searching, we can go off on paths that are very unwise. Why? Because we think we know it all. How many of you wish you knew as much as you thought you knew when you were 18? Right? Man, I wish I knew that much. But I, didn't, I never knew that much. But when, we, when we're young, we think we've got the world by the tail and we, we can do it. And you know what? We, we do. We risk. But we've got to make sure that we're following God's way and not our way. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. Guys, we can go our own way and we can search for it, but I'm telling you that God has already laid out a path. Now, through this, these teachings, here's what I hope you do. I hope if you don't know Christ that you learn about the way to follow Christ. But if you do know Christ, here's what I hope you learn. I hope you learn what man is really looking for so that you can begin to be a witness to the world and answer the questions that the world is asking. For too long, the church has been answering the questions the world is not asking instead of answering the questions that the world is asking. They're looking for purpose and meaning, and we've got to show them the way. Amen? Come on. So, the, actually, there's a, a, another scripture in Proverbs that says, The way of the Lord is a refuge for the blameless, but it is the ruin of those who do evil. There's a way that God wants us to live. There's a way that God wants us to, to follow him. And, and he's laid it out real clear. The centerpiece of our history is Jesus Christ. Do you realize that we mark time by the life of Jesus? B.C. before Christ. A.D. in the year of our Lord. We, we, we separate time by the person of Jesus Christ. So the witness is out there of there is a way. And so we can tell them that. But he goes on to say, just to get a glimpse beyond the illusion. The enemy is notorious for pulling the wool over our eyes. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of who? Christ, who is the image of God. You want to see Jesus, uh, God the Father? See Jesus. We just talked about it in our last series. This is the way. We talked about, you want to see God? He says, when you see me, you see my Father. Me and the Father are one. In other words, look at me. I'm showing you God. If you want to get to know God, look at Jesus. And he's, and, but the God of this age has done what? He blinds the eyes of unbelievers. And that's why so many people struggle in this day and time. And, and that's even what he's saying in this song. Just to get a glimpse beyond the illusion of it. It's easy to get caught up in our illusions, though. Now, we're not doing uh, at the movies. We, we've done that for quite a few years. And, and a few years ago, I did the movie The Matrix. And The Matrix is all about waking up in an illusion, waking up in a false world, and you think that everything's going around, and that's exactly what the enemy wants to do. He wants to make all of us think 
that the illusion that we're living in is real life. It's not. Real life begins and ends with Jesus. It starts with him. It ends with him. And if you want to have real life on this planet, you need to, you need to follow him. Amen? You need to follow his way because his way will lead you to the reality. You don't have to live with this false, these, these false expectations, but you will live in the truth. 1 John 4, 4 through 6 says this, My dear children, you come from God and belong to God. You have already won a big victory over these false teachers, for the Spirit is in you. So far stronger than anything in the world. These people belong to a Christ-denying world. They talk the world's language and the world eats it up. But we come from God and belong to God. And anyone who knows God understands us and listens. The person who has nothing to do with God's will, of course, will not listen to us. This is another test for telling the spirit of truth from the spirit of deception. You see... We, when we come out and we know the truth, this is why we need to lead people to the place to where they can understand the way and not be led into deception, continue to live in deception. And there's so many different, quote, truths out there today. But we got to ra- rise above that. we got to get to the tr- real truth. Some people look at money as the end all of everything. i got to go after money. If I get enough money, then everything will be okay. That's not it. That's not it. It goes on in the next verse. It says, I was soaring ever higher, but I flew too high. This is man's attempt to reach something that they, they know they can't reach. And yet, what do we do when we fly too high? We our our wings melt, as the as the old story tells. Our wings melt and we fall back to earth. What is that? It's, it's about our pride. So many times our pride keeps us from following God's way. Guys, can I be just blatantly honest with you? That my heart is broken when I sit down with people and I talk with them and they go, you know, they struggle to just give God permission to work in their life. And I'm going, and they tell me about struggle and, and problems and issues. And, and I'm not saying that if you, you come to know Christ that you'll never have a problem. You'll never face a battle. I'm not saying that. But I'm telling you that it breaks my heart when I see people that are continuing to go from one crisis to another crisis to another crisis to another crisis. And so much is their own doing because they won't give God permission to work in their life or they won't follow his way. We try to soar ever higher, but our pride keeps us. Pride, we know this one, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride goes before a fall. I grew up hearing that all the time. Why? Because when we're so prideful and we think we know what to do, we think we've got the way, guess what? We're going to live by our own decisions. And you know what I found out? I'm an idiot. Anybody else found out that? Come on, let's, let's be real in the house of God today. I found out that my thinking is stupid compared to God's thinking. I found out that me doing it my way, it, I, I fall on my face over and over and over again. And sometimes God says, okay, boy, go ahead and try it again. He's just going, I'm waiting on you. When you beat your head enough against that brick wall and you turn around and say, Father, will you help me? We come to that grip of going, I just came to my senses. I think I may need to do something different, right? Hey, we can have fun in the house of God, can't we? Come on now. He he goes on uh, in in, uh, Proverbs 28, 14. Blessed is the one who always trembles before the Lord. In other words, somebody who is humble, who yields themselves before God. But whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. You can try to fly high on your own, but you're going to fail every single time. Why? Because it takes a submitted life. And I'm telling you that this is what the world is struggling with. If you're a Christian and you've got friends, you probably see it. You probably see friends that will not listen to God's way. They go, I'm going to keep doing my own thing. Bless God, I'm going to do my own thing. Well, go ahead and do your own thing. 
And you're there at the wall beating your head over and over and over again. And, and God saying, I got a door right down here. Would you, like, would you like to go through the door? But guys, it's because they can't see. And this is why we need to be tellers of the truth. This is why we need to lovingly put our arms around people. He says, though my eyes could see, I still was a blind man. This comes right from the Hebrew scriptures, from, but Isaiah 6, 9, through, 9 and 10, you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. This people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. How many has ever seen that in, in maybe some of your friends and some of the world out there? There's some people that have closed their eyes to the truth. And oh, even though they're seeing, they're not, never, never truly seeing or perceiving. Guys, God has a better way. He goes on in the next verse. Says, though my mind could think, I still was a madman. You know, when we're wise in our own eyes, we're susceptible to falling into the same Ruts that we have fallen in year and year and year after. Guys, I want, I, want us, I want us as Christians to live differently. And I want to save people from the things that I see so many people repeating the same cycles. You know, I, I have people sometimes come to counseling and, and we start counseling and they get a little bit of freedom. And they go out and guess what? A year later they come back and they're doing the exact same thing again. And I'm like, but... Okay, let's start over. And we get going and we get a little bit of freedom. And then if you don't break free, if you don't let God have it all, you can't just take a little bit of Jesus and mix it in with the rest of it. You know, I can take a mud pie and I can put a little bit of sugar in it. Ain't going to taste good. A lot of Christians want to take that, except they want to take a chocolate pie and put, you know, just 1% of poop in it. I, I just need a little bit of the world. Let me, how many of you want to eat that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix you a pie, and I'm only going to put, you know, one ounce of, of dog poop in it, and you can have it. Would you like it? No. But that's kind of the, the, the thing we're going back and forth with. Proverbs 26, 12 says, Do you see a person wise in their own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than them. When we're wise in our own eyes, there's more hope for a fool than us. Guys, this picture that he paints in this song, and, and listen, I've sung this song so many times over and over again, but when you start looking at the words, you see the desperation of, a, a, of people saying, I need something different. This is not working because that's what these are saying. He goes on. He says, I hear the voices when I'm dreaming. I can hear them say, let me just say, if you're hearing voices, okay, if you're hearing voices, there's one voice you need to be hearing. It's the voice of the good shepherd. Now, there are other voices out there. But you better listen to the one voice. You better listen to the true voice that will lead you to that place of healing and wholeness. That will lead you to a place of safety and protection. And, and we've got to follow the voice of the good shepherd. John uh, chapter 10 verses 4 and 5. And when he has brought out all of his own... He goes ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. When you don't know the good shepherd, there's a lot of voices that will try to speak to you. But you better tune your ear in to the one true voice. That's what all of us need. And that's why we, it's so important that we as the body of Christ introduce people to the good shepherd so that they can hear the true voice that loves them, that cares for them, and everything that God is going to tell you. Even if it's hard times, it's, it's something that where you're going to have to walk through a tough time, I'm telling you, it will still take you to a place of healing and wholeness. It will take you to a place where it will change your life. Let's go to verse 2, and we're going to look at some of those. It says, 
Masquerading as a man with a reason, my charade was the event of the season. If I claim to be a wise man, well, it surely means that I don't know. He even recognized that. Then he goes on. On a stormy sea of moving emotions, tossed about like a ship on the ocean, I set a course for winds of fortune, but I can hear the voices say. As we're looking at this, and we're, we're looking at this, this is another, uh, really a re, retelling of, of a lot of the things in the first verse. Masquerading as a man with a reason. You know, this is another, uh, another need that every person has. Every person on this planet has a need for purpose. Why are you here? Why are you created? And yet, many people masquerade. They, they pretend. They, they live the facade. They're, they're, they're oh yeah, I've, I've got a purpose. It's to make money. Well, they go make money and then they go, that, that doesn't do it. It's not fulfilling me. I'm not, I'm not fulfilling what God created me to be. It reminds me of the quote by Jim Carrey. He said, I hope everyone gets fame, fortune, and riches so they can find out that it's not all that it's cut out to be. I mean, guys, there's more to life than money. There's more to life than fame. And this guy, these guys that are writing these hit songs, they have fame, right? He said, my charade is the event of the season. I'm, I'm putting on the facade. He goes on, if I claim to be a wise man, well, it surely means that I don't know. This is the beginning point of where things can change. You know, Kerry Livgren in his story said at this point he was touring with, uh, Kansas was touring with a, a, a Louisiana band called Louisiana LaRue. They used to sing that song, New Orleans Ladies. Uh, and, and see, uh, I, I, I love Louisiana bands. And, and so, I mean, that was, that was one of my songs I loved. And, and, and it's like, as they were traveling together, the lead singer, or, or, and, lead singer and, and guitarist, Jeff Pollard, was a very powerful disciple of Christ that had actually been trained in helping people come out of cults. And, and Kerry Livergan said, well, I wasn't really in a cult, but, but this guy had a way of talking to me. And, and Kerry Livergan was so moved by what this guy was saying that as they were on tour together, he would actually uh, get on the bus with Louisiana LaRue, and he said, we would have these theological discussions for eight and nine hours a day. And then we would go play our gig that night, and it'd start over the next day. And, and so he had done this, and... And he had, um, and let me just read this. And he said, and we would go over various points about the person and nature of Christ. Although I would try so hard uh, as I could to logically in every way to swing him over to my side of the fence, I started noticing these feelings in me that I really wanted him to be right. I think that I knew in my heart that he was right and that the Bible was the word of God. Partially it was pride that didn't want to give up something that I had believed in and had been proven wrong. In fact, what, what had happened is I had been taken in and suckered into a demonic doctrine. Isn't that crazy? That here he is, he's wanting that. But you see, this is, this is what Isaiah even talks about. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Guys, this sums up the world we live in today. I know this song was written back in 1976, but it still speaks to where man is living today. I mean, we, we are changing good for evil and evil for good. We are changing what's light for darkness and darkness for light. And it says, woe to those because those who are wise in their own eyes. Guys, that's where the world has got. Most people think they're smarter than the Word of God. But you know what? You better go back to the Word of God because it's proven itself true since it's been written. The Old Testament proves itself true. The New Testament proves itself true. And you can bank on it. 
Like I told you a few weeks, weeks ago when we were talking about the Bible showing the way, I believe it from the index to the maps. I believe it all. Why? Because it's what we need a strong foundation to build our life on, and I can trust that. Well, pastor, have you ever been? I've been to theology. I've heard all the different theories about, well, this may conflict here and this may. Listen. This is God's word. And if you're doubting it, guess what? You'll never get anything out of it anyway. But if you put your faith and trust in God, here's what I trust. If there happens to be, and I'm, I'm going to just be a good old dumb Christian from this standpoint. I'm going to believe God that he says what he says, and I'm going to follow it. And if there's something that's out of order in here, God will get me around that and through it. I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit to lead me. Amen? Amen. All right. I, I just got to say that. And he goes on, and really he talks about what happens when we change, when we masquerade, when we change that. He says, on a stormy sea of moving emotion tossed about like a ship on the ocean. Reminds me of, of James chapter 1, a person who is double-minded. He is unstable in all his ways, tossed to and fro. That's why we got to have a firm foundation because, guys, what we're to do is we're to live by faith and not by sight. That's what we're called to do. And if we want the world to come over to where we're at, if we're wanting to bring the world to a place of safety and healing, they've got to see us living this way. Boy, it's quiet in this house. I mean, look. This is just the truth. I'm just speaking the truth and love because, guys, this is the way we're supposed to live. 2 Samuel says, I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise and who has been and have been saved from my enemies. Now, this affects this second part. It says, the waves of death swirled about me. The torrents of destruction overwhelm me. Sounds like that verse that he wrote on a sea of emotion, tossed like a ship. The cords of the grave coiled around me, and the snares of death confronted me. When you don't know Jesus, guess what? This is exactly where you live on a regular basis. You live with death and destruction and all of these things around you. Why? Because you don't know the truth. But those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Aren't you glad? I'm glad I, live, I am standing on a rock and I am not shaking. The waves can come and go. They can beat against that rock, but my rock ain't going to shake because I'm standing on Jesus. And then he says something, this, and I'm getting to where I'm going to start bringing this down. He says, I set my course for winds of fortune. That's what we do when we're in our desperate times I've seen I've seen this even in my own life even in my Christian walk there's been times where I could see my life my 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 life and it wasn't in order and you know what I did is I I I, I looked to something else oh I'm gonna go I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna do this how many of, of you have ever done that that you you distract yourself from your own issues it's like, well, I'll go over here and I'll, I'll, I'll do something over here. I'll, go, I'll start something new. How many of you start something new every few weeks just to have something joyful in your life? And, but after you've done it for a few weeks, it seems empty. Guess what? We can do that over and over and over again. We can set our course for winds of fortune. But, but what's that going to take you to? See, when you have the greatest treasure of all, you don't have to set your, your course for winds of fortune. All you got to do is rest in the person that is the greatest gift of all, Jesus Christ. Let me read this from Isaiah. It says, But as for you who forsake the Lord and forget my holy mountain, who spread a table for fortune and fill bowls mixed with wine for destiny, I will destine you for the sword. And all of you will fall in the slaughter. For I have called, but you did not answer. I spoke to you, but you did not listen. You didn't evil in my sight and chose what displeases me. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's amazing how the Word of God, written thousands of years ago, speaks to right where we live today. It speaks to where we live what are you hearing the voices say? 
You know, when I, I, I think of that winds of fortune, it reminds me of the wayward son from God's word. And I want to bring, us, uh, bring the, this message to a close talking about him. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus talks about three lost things. A lost coin, a lost sheep, and a lost son. And it sounds, the, the very thing that this wayward son sounds just like this song. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, I want you to know that asking for your half of the inheritance, and actually it wasn't half, he only got a third because he wasn't the oldest son, but he, he got a third and he said, give me mine now. That's like, that's like walking up to your dad and going, I hope you die. But since you're not dying, give me my money. It's a great way to make a relate, have a relationship with your dad, right? But but what he was he he did something very dishonorable in the Jewish culture, and it says not long after that, what did he do? He set his course for winds of fortune. The younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Oh, it's going to be so much better over there. I got all this money. I'm going to go party. You know, I'm going to have a blast in life, right? But is that going to fill you? No. In fact, it caused him to waste every bit of money. You see, carrying on and doing that, going after that fortune... It's what many today, they're looking for fortune and fame, but it will leave you empty. I remember an interview they did at, with Tom Brady after he had won like his third Super Bowl. And they were doing, it was on NBC, and it, it stands out to me because they were talking to him and go, so Tom, how does it feel to, you know, have won three Super Bowls? And, he, and, and in the middle of it, he had a moment of clarity. That was, he goes, you know, he goes, I asked myself, There's got to be more than this, right? I mean, that's a telltale sign. Here is a man. He he is married to a model, okay? He is probably the greatest, I mean, some people may, you know, debate it and stuff, but the greatest quarterback of all time, and he's now won six Super Bowls, I think it is, six Super Bowls. The man has got everything that the world can offer him, and this is the question. He goes, There's got to be more than this. That is the heart of man. Man is looking for something to fill them. And God's the only thing, and this is why we as Christians have got to be witnesses of the good news that Jesus came to give us life and that more abundantly. And it's not, when he says abundant life, he's not just talking about riches. I believe God wants to bless us that way too. But you know what? That's not the main thing. The main thing is you have peace in your heart. If you got peace in your heart, you'll be happier than a person who just won the lottery. Why? Because it's real. It's something that we're looking for. That's the abundant life. I live in the abundant life. I hope you live in the abundant life. And when you live in the abundant life, your abundant life that you're living in will be a draw to those who are lost and broken. Because they're going to go, what you got, I want. And you know what you can tell them? It's not how much money you got. It's not uh, how big a house you got. It's not any of that. It's I got Jesus. Listen, I kind of connect with Paul when he says, I've had lots and I've had little. I mean, I remember uh, the first apartment we had down in Florida. I mean, termites had eaten outside. I mean, it was a, a, I mean, a, not, not a nice apartment. And I'm blessed with the house I have now that's just, I call it my God house because there's no way I would ever afford it and on this side of heaven. Ain't no way, but God gave it to me. So it doesn't matter how much you have or how little you have. If you have Jesus, that's the main thing. So he goes on, and let me just quickly go through this. It says, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. This was the grossest thing, the grossest thing that a Hebrew could do because pigs were unclean. 
And he, he was out there. And it says, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Let me, let me stop right here and give you this picture. This is what I see so many people in today's time. They're filling themselves up with slop. They're filling themselves up with slop so they can have a momentary moment of satisfaction. They're going after things. They're going after drugs. They're going after sex. They're going after alcohol. Whatever it is, they're trying to find something to fill that void. They're trying to find something to give them a relief. But they're still empty because no one's giving you anything. There is someone who has given you everything, and his name's Jesus. Because he gave you his entire life. It says, and when he came to his, come on, say it with me. When he came to his, when he came to his senses. In other words, he had been beating his head against the rock. He had been trying to do it his own way. He had been trying to get fame and fortune and he wasted it all and lost it all. And here he is, he's been doing that and now he comes to his senses. He recognized, wait. This ain't right. I got I got There's there's so much more to life than this. He said. So. He said, "How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death." Now you say, "Well, he was coming to the Lord for all the wrong reasons." Guess what? That may be the way you you come to the Lord. You may come for all the wrong reasons. God, I need you to heal this. God, I need you to do this. You know what God is willing to do? He's willing to look past that and love you right where you're at. You may come for the wrong reasons, but when you get there and you meet him, it'll change those reasons around, and then you'll have a real reason to stay in relationship with him. Amen? Amen. And listen, this is what happened to Kerry. He got to this point where he'd been talking to John uh, from uh, LaRue, and, and they had been having these conversations. And he, he said he had come to the, realize the difference between what he believed and what the Bible said. There was a disparity to the, and, and it pointed out the nature of Christ and who he really was. And it started eating at him. He started to see the difference between this false religion and, and the reality of who Jesus was. And it started to really get into his, under his skin. And he says, why is this book denying the things which the Bible says, in fact, are my salvation? And he goes on to say, he says, it became clear to me in a flash that this thing was designed to dazzle the intellect, the intellect and was actually led me astray from what I knew in my heart to be the truth, the Bible. At that point, I don't think there was any doubt in my mind that I was going to become a Christian, although I hadn't got down on my knees asking the Lord to forgive me and giving myself completely to Him. You see, this was Kerry Livergren's moment of coming to his senses. He realized, hey, this book I've been Building my life on is full of lies, but this book, the Bible, the Word of God is true. The person of Jesus is true. He is who He says He is. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is someone I can depend on, and if I'll go to Him, I can be saved. you got to start with coming to your senses, and that's what we need to help our friends. We need to help our loved ones. We need to help those that don't know Christ. We need to help them come to their senses. And this is what it says. And I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. You see, you have to come to your senses. We've got to lead people to the place where they come to their senses. Then you've got to take that step of faith. You've got to start that walk back toward the father. You got to start that walk. And, and this is what Kerry Livgren said. He said, I did accept Jesus a few days later in a hotel room in Indianapolis, Indiana at 3 o'clock in the morning. And at that moment, the Spirit swept over me like a flood and I cried like a baby and I knew that I had found the Lord. That was July 29, 1979. You see, guys, I'm telling you, this is what can happen when you 
We, we speak the truth, we live the truth, when we act the truth in front of our friends, they can see the truth and it will set them free. And they'll, they'll come to their senses, they can take that step of faith, and then here's the wonderful thing, and let me finish this sermon up with this. And while he was still a long way off, this is how Father God is looking. He is constantly looking at the horizon, waiting for those wayward sons to come home. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son. Notice, he wasn't wasn't filled with judgment. He was filled with compassion. Your heavenly father is sitting on ready to run to you and to grab you up and to throw you into his arm. Why? Because he is filled with compassion. Look, whenever I, I, I meet someone who is struggling and battling and stuck in their way of living and it is destroying their life, I'm not filled with judgment. I am filled with compassion. Why? Because I see someone who could be saved and yet they're not saved. And guys, that's the kind of compassion. We need to get moved by the spirit that when we come in, in contact with our friends and we we interact with them that we begin to be moved with compassion that goes father they're headed down a path that's going to lead them to hell but I want to bring them to heaven I want to bring them into relationship with you and it says he ran to his son he threw his arms around him and he kissed him and he said The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick. He didn't even listen to his his reason for coming back. Because he knew it wasn't right. He didn't didn't worry about that. He goes, he says, quick. Bring the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. That's what happens every time someone comes back to Jesus, comes back to the Father. There's a celebration. Years ago, I wrote a little parody of, Celebrate good times, come on. I wrote a little parody, Christian parody. Celebrate someone's come home. Why? Because there's a celebration in heaven. And you know who's doing the celebrating? Father God is doing the celebrating. He is excited. He is sitting already. And so, you know, I believe if, if Carrie could rewrite the words to this song, I believe he would write something like this. Come home, my wayward son. Don't keep running. Don't keep on going your wayward way. He would say, come home, my wayward son. There'll be peace when you're done running. I know it doesn't have the rhyme as the other one, but. Lay your weary head to rest. Don't you cry no more. You see, even even the, the original chorus has this falseness in it that says, hey, you can just keep running your own way. Eventually, may, you're going to find rest and peace. No. There's only one way to find rest and peace, and that's coming back to the Father. That's coming and meeting Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But this is what he promises those that come home. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. For those of us who have received Christ, I believe we have a mandate like never before. I believe the time is getting short. You go, well, pastor, they've been saying that for 50 years. They've been saying, well, actually, they've been saying it for 2,000 years. So guess what? We're 2,000 years closer than we've ever been to the Lord's return. But you know what? I want you to know, if you come, as you as a Christian, you've got the best news. You've got the best news, the good news of Jesus Christ to give to the world. But if you don't know Christ today, here's the good news. God loves you. He sent his son to die for you to pay for your sins. And if you'll accept him, he will, with open arms, welcome you into his family. Would you bow your heads with me? If you're sitting here today and you go, Pastor, I need Jesus today. I've I've never received Christ. I've never given my life to, 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 
to Christ and I need Jesus today. Is there anyone here today? I just want to pray with you if you need to receive Christ. If you're joining us online and, and you need to receive Christ, just stop right there in this moment. Ask Him to come in to be your Lord and Savior. That means you're willing to let Him be first in your life. Ask Him to wash away your sins. And you've taken the first step in your relationship with Him. For the rest of you who already know Christ, here's my challenge to you today. My challenge is that you... Because you have this greatest gift, that you will tell others about it. You'll share with other people the good news of Jesus. You will show them the love of Jesus by your actions and your deeds. And you will pray for the lost. Because there are many wayward sons out there that need you. Jesus. They need Jesus in their life. If you go, Pastor, I'm going to commit to doing that. You're just saying, I'm, I'm going to join with you, Pastor. I'm going to be praying. I'm going to be praying for that. Would you slip up a hand? I just want to agree with you. Father, right now, thank you, Father, for this church being a church that is praying, that is uh, witnessing, that is showing love by the way we live. We're telling the good news. And, Father, we're making a difference. Father, I'm praying for a revival in Marshall County. I'm praying for change in this community. I'm praying that you would impact Marshall County like never before. Father, I'm praying for a breakthrough, for a breakthrough in Jesus' name that, Father, lost are going to be saved, that, Father, they're just going to be lining up to come to come to know you. Father, I'm praying for people to come to their senses, to take that step of faith and to come meet you who's waiting with open arms to receive. In Jesus' name, amen.